Welcome everybody to the virtual webinar series. This is our first time doing this with OCB this summer, and we're just giving it a try to help us stay connected as a community. Um, it was very sad for us to have to cancel our in-person workshop, and we in no way view this as a replacement for that. This is merely an opportunity to connect and share great science this summer. So I wanna welcome you. We had 152 people register as of the time that I, that I turned on the webinar. So we're getting really great engagement with the community. Um, my name is Heather Benway. I am the executive officer of the OCB program and project office. And I wanted to introduce and acknowledge my co-host Mae Mahegan, who's our communications officer and OCB's administrative associate, Mary Zawoski. And I also want to introduce the OCB scientific steering committee. Um, you can learn more on our website and the about menu um, about the SSC. But the SSC is helping to organize and chair each of these sessions and I will be sure to highlight um, SSC members um, who have, are joining us today who are co chairing the session are Hillary. Uh, I'm sorry, our Andrea Fassbender from Mbari and Seth Bushinsky from University of Hawaii. And they'll be introducing our speakers. Um, our project office is based at Woods Hole Oceanographic, and we receive support from NSF and NASA. And we're basically a network of scientists working across disciplines to better understand the ocean's role in the global carbon cycle and how marine ecosystems function and are responding to environmental change. So you can see our, our main science areas here, these, these green icons represent our overarching science areas. There are six of them. Um, you can read them on the screen, obviously, but if you want to get a sense of what our more specific research questions are, you can visit our website at the, um, under again, under the about menu, just go to about OCB and you can learn more about the, the scientific questions, specific research questions that we as a community are really interested in. And I want to make the point that this OCB is really a bottom up program. So we, we are that those research questions are continually changing in response to community interest and enthusiasm and. You can get a sneak peek at the next month's worth of seminars right here. I've put them in a table here, but you can go to our website and find out all of the speakers that are lined up for this session or for the summer webinar series. Um, it's going to really span all of OCB science areas, the green icons and the, the research priorities. Um, so you'll get a really broad swath of OCB science featured during this series. Um, if this is really well received, we'd love to think about extending this and it can focus on a lot of different areas of OCB. It doesn't just have to be science questions. Um, there are a lot of discussions right now about diversity. There are a lot of discussions um, about online learning. There are a lot of opportunities for us to connect and, and this is a really good platform for that. Uh, lots of ways to get involved with the program. If you're new to OCB, I've just listed a few of those here. Most importantly, if you wanna get in touch, you can email us anytime at this email below on the screen, ocb underscore news at hui.edu. Um, you can follow us on social media. We're on Twitter. Um, you can see our Twitter handle here, and we're also on YouTube, searchable under Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry. And I want to point out that all of our webinars are going to be recorded and well, they'll be posted on the YouTube site, so you can get that there. Um, please visit our website. That's really the most comprehensive information resource about the program. And when you're on the website, you can actually subscribe to our biweekly e-newsletter, which is a fantastic resource. It's kind of a catch-all for all things OCB and our port partner programs. Um, it's a really great resource for um, jobs and postdocs as well. Just a few guidelines. This is a WebEx event. And so all attendees are automatically muted for these, especially when we have a lot of people participating. Uh, we ask you politely to save your questions until after each talk is over. Um, after the talks, after each talk is over, um, I, as the moderator, will go through as many questions as we have time for. And you're going to use the Q&A function to do that. And I'm going to show you on the next slide how to find the Q&A function because this is WebEx and it's not as user friendly as other platforms. Um, if you have a tech issue, please chat with the hosts. May and I are the hosts of this of this webinar and we can try to help you 
as the, the talks are going on. And there's also dial up information here. Um, if you're having trouble viewing the slides, know that we will post the recording of the webinar later on, and you'll be able to see the whole thing with the slides later. So if you want to just listen in for now, you can always just pick up your phone and dial in. Um, here is a here's a screenshot of what you're probably looking at right now. We've got a speaker. There's you can change your visual layout in the right layout in the right hand corner here. If you want the call in de details, if your internet starts flaking, you can go to there and get the phone information. And then these buttons on the bottom are the control buttons. Um, you are automatically muted as an attendee. Um, there's you can um, access the chat function via this little messaging icon. And then this dot, dot, dot is where you find the Q and A. This has Q and A and additional options as well. Um, and then the X is for leaving the webinar. So the theme of today's webinar is physical and biogeochemical processes that drive the biological pump. And our speakers are Hilary Polevsky from Boston College's Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences and Yuan Lort from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Um, we are also, as I told you before, joined by our OCB SSC member hosts for this session, um, Andrea Fassbender from Mbari and Seth Bashinsky from University of Hawaii. Um, I would like to ask Seth to introduce our first speaker, Hillary. Thanks, Heather. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hillary Pleski this morning. Dr. Pleski is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Boston College. Her research combines field measurements at sea, autonomous sensor data for moorings and robots, satellite observations, and global climate simulations to investigate how the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, thereby influencing the global carbon cycle and climate. Prior to her current position at Boston College, Dr. Plesky earned her PhD in oceanography and a graduate certificate in climate science at the University of Washington. She completed a postdoctoral, postdoctoral scholarship at marine chemistry at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and taught at Wellesley College and the Evergreen State College. Today, Dr. Polesky will be talking about the role of wintertime ventilation on the ocean's biological carbon pump. And so with that, I'll let Dr. Polesky take it away. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, and thank you to the entire OCB community and especially to um, Heather and May for making this virtual seminar series happen. And to all of you from all of the places that you are right now for taking the time to tune in. Um, so I'm really excited to be um, part of this um, pair of talks talking about one of my favorite subjects, the ocean's biological carbon pump. Um, and in my presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the influence of winter ventilation on this really important process. Okay. Um, so before getting into the details of the biological pump, even though I know all of us in the OCB community are really interested in the ocean's role in the global carbon cycle, I wanted to start a little bit by setting the stage here. So we know that the ocean carbon sink absorbs about a quarter of our annual fossil fuel carbon emissions. Um, and so in order to really understand this ocean carbon sink, we want to think about um, what's driving both its spatial and temporal variability. And so this spatial variability is depicted here where we can see the blue regions on the map are places that are strong sinks, taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but there are also these regions in orange that are net sources emitting carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. And so in the broad kind of science we do, trying to understand both the spatial and temporal variability in the ocean carbon cycle, we really have to get under the hood to understand the individual mechanisms that allow the ocean to exchange carbon dioxide with the atmosphere. And so this is a classic figure that we tend to use in thinking about the individual biological, chemical, and physical processes that drive the ocean carbon cycle. And so today we're going to be focusing on the biological pump depicted on the left. And so briefly, this is the process by which phytoplankton in the surface ocean photosynthesize, convert carbon dioxide into organic carbon, and some fraction of that organic carbon escapes being consumed by bacteria, zooplankton, and other heterotrophic organisms in the surface ocean, 
and can sink or be transported into the deep ocean and sequestered away from contact with the atmosphere on timescales from months to centuries. Now, in this traditional view, we think of the biological pump as being separate from these chemical and physical processes, which are often thought of together in the context of the solubility pump, where cold waters absorb more carbon dioxide gas from the atmosphere and then can be subducted into the deep ocean and again sequestered away from contact with the atmosphere. Um, but more and more work is showing that we can't think about the biological pump isolated from chemical and physical processes. And we need to think about how they're all interacting in order to better understand the biological pump. So today, both in my talk um, and Joanne's talk following mine, we're really going to focus on the importance of these physical processes as well, and know how we have to think of them as being um, interconnected with understanding the biological pump. And so why focus on the biological pump in the first place? Um, well, there are many reasons we're interested in this process, but for me, one of the main motivators is thinking about the fact that the biological pump is currently projected under our current generation of Earth system models to decrease in strength over the 21st century. So this figure on the left um, from Loren Bopp's work summarizing uh, model projections from all of the CMIP-5 simulations shows that export production defined as particulate organic carbon flux through 100 meters is projected to decrease over the 21st century under a high carbon emissions scenario. And so even a small perturbation to this process could have really significant effects on the global carbon cycle. And the reason for that is our overall estimate of the magnitude of the biological pump is between 5 and 13 petagrams of carbon per year, a really large number significantly larger than the total strength of the ocean carbon sink and about comparable to the current annual fossil fuel carbon emissions. So even a relatively small fractional change to this large biological pump flux could have a significant feedback effect on the future trajectory of um, global climate change. I'll also note that this range of between 5 and 13 petagrams of carbon per year is a really significant range and really significant uncertainty. Um, and so this is also due to our relatively um, limited set of observational data of the biological pump, also emphasizing the importance of additional observations to help us better constrain this number. So the story that I'm going to tell today focuses in particular on the biological pump in the high latitude ocean. And I'm really interested in the high latitudes first because they feature some of our strongest ocean carbon sinks. Um, the bluest regions on this map are in our high latitude regions. And I'm also in the high, interested in the high latitudes because some of um, these places are where the biological pump and the ocean carbon cycle has particularly been undersampled, especially in winter. And so this isn't surprising if we think about the traditional ways we've gone out in ships to actually observationally constrain the biological pump going out in ships in winter in these high latitude regions isn't a lot of fun, and so we've just done it many fewer times than the kinds of measurements we've been making during spring and summertime. So I'm going to start with an observational story focused in the subpolar North Atlantic. And so this is a high latitude region where we're particularly interested in the biological pump because it features a large spring phytoplankton bloom that we can see depicted here in this really lovely animation of ocean chlorophyll. So we know that that spring bloom drives significant seasonal export of carbon from the um, spring and summertime stratified surface ocean. But the question that I'm interested in asking is how much of that carbon is ultimately being sequestered over annual or longer timescales? And so some of our initial evidence that we really need to capture the full seasonal cycle of the biological pump also comes from the North Atlantic um, with work um, led by Arnie Kortzinger um, and Paul Quay, where they actually made measurements of dissolved gas tracers of the biological pump, not just during the spring and summer biologically productive period, but over the full seasonal cycle. And so we can see in Kortzinger's work um, shown on the left, um, he measured the partial pressure of carbon dioxide throughout the full year at the PAP site. Um, and this is the Takahashi decomposition showing the biophysical effects on PCO2, where we see this expected drawdown of PCO2 during spring and summer that's being driven by um, that um, 
biological production in the surface ocean, but we can also see that the PCO2 um, non-thermal effect then increases during fall and winter um, at the time that we have deep winter mixing. We can see a similar thing in measurements of dissolved oxygen supersaturation um, from Quay et al. looking at Carina data across the North Atlantic, um, where they see dissolved oxygen supersaturation during um, the spring and summer period indicating net biological production in the surface ocean, but by also having measurements of oxygen during winter, they were able to see that this is then balanced by an oxygen undersaturation um, during winter when we have a net respiration signature that's being brought up from below. So what can explain what we're seeing in this data throughout the full seasonal cycle? Well, to think about this, we need to understand that the seasonal cycle of biological carbon export is also really strongly influenced by this process of winter ventilation in the subpolar North Atlantic. Um, so this is showing um, a time series throughout the entire year of the North Atlantic, looking through depth from the surface all the way down to below the deepest winter mixed layer. And so we see this strong seasonal cycle with strong stratification in spring and summer, and then the mixed layer deepens to climatological mixed layers deeper than 1,000 meters in some parts of the subpolar North Atlantic. And so if we think about what's happening to the biological pump throughout this seasonal cycle, we have our phytoplankton photosynthesizing, converting carbon dioxide to organic carbon during that spring and summer period, and some fraction of that organic carbon sinks or is transported out of that stratified surface ocean um, and we can think of those particles sinking through the water column. But that's not the end of the story, because as those particles are sinking, they're actively being consumed and respired by heterotrophic organisms, converting that organic carbon back into an inorganic form. And so then when the mix layer deepens during winter, we can entrain that respired carbon back into the mix layer, and it's ventilated back to the atmosphere. So unless it sinks below the deepest annual mixed layer depth or the winter ventilation depth, it's not actually being sequestered away from contact with the atmosphere, influencing the global carbon cycle on these annual or longer time scales. And so we have this great data from surface measurements in the mixed layer showing the importance of this process and allowing us to uncover that this is happening. But we also really want to have data throughout the full water column and throughout the full seasonal cycle to help us better understand how all of these mechanisms fit together to not only constrain the total annual rate of biologically sequestered carbon, but also under, understand the magnitude and timing of seasonal export from the stratified surface ocean, respiration within the seasonal thermocline, and then winter ventilation of that respired carbon. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of one way that I've been looking at this kind of full seasonal cycle data um, using my favorite tracer, dissolved oxygen, that you also saw a little bit of in the Quay et al. paper, um, but now having dissolved oxygen throughout the full water column and throughout the full seasonal cycle. And so the uh, measurement platform that's allowed us to do this for the first time is the Ocean Observatories Initiative Erminger Sea Array. Um, and so this is some work that I've been doing in collaboration with Rue Nicholson at Huey, where we're using data from the OOI moorings and their gliders um, from this location in the Erminger Sea. And I'm not going to have time to go into details about all of the different platforms and measurements across this array, but the thing that I really want to emphasize that has been transformative about this work is that they have four moorings, including a surface piercing profile, a surface Pro, um, a surface um, platform, a subsurface profiler, um, and multiple gliders that make measurements from the surface down to 1,000 meters. And every single one of these platforms is equipped with a dissolved oxygen optode, giving us that oxygen data from the surface down to below that deep winter mixed layer. And so just to give you a bit of an example of what we can see from our first look at some of these data, um, this is some work um, that's been led by my undergraduate senior thesis student, Lucy Wanzer, um, where she looked at the subsurface respiration and winter ventilation data from the profiler boring. And so this five-year time series is shown here going from 200 meters all the way down below the winter ventilation depth. 
And the first thing I want you to note is that there are two clearly distinct layers. Um, the layer closer to the surface that's ventilated each year, and then we can see the subsurface layer that's been out of contact with the atmosphere for multiple years. But then we can also see there's this clear seasonal cycle within the seasonally ventilated layer, um, where we can see that the um, oxygen increases each winter when um, that winter ventilation occurs and exposes the thermocline back to contact with the atmosphere. And then when it restratifies during spring, um, we then have a decrease in oxygen over the course of the stratified spring and summer season. And that decrease in oxygen is being driven by respiration of that organic carbon that's sinking from above. And so we can make this calculation of the total respiration over that stratified season in each one of these years and in every layer from the top of the profile or mooring all the way down to the depth of winter ventilation that can allow us to determine the total amount of carbon that's being respired within the seasonal thermocline and ventilated back to the atmosphere the next winter. And so importantly, this is the carbon that we might have counted as having been exported or sequestered if we weren't accounting for this process of winter ventilation, but isn't actually being stored long term away from contact with the atmosphere. So hopefully I've convinced you that at least in this one location in the North Atlantic, it's important for us to consider this process of winter ventilation. But I now want to turn to thinking about this broader global question of whether winter ventilation influences carbon sequestration via the biological pump on a global scale. And because of our limited amount of observational data on the biological pump, I'm now going to turn from observations to models, since models give us the ability to actually look throughout the full year and throughout the full water column at what's happening to the process of the biological pump. However, one caveat in thinking about um, our previous model-based analyses of the biological pump is in the past, we haven't been thinking about this process of winter ventilation. There have been lots of great studies looking at Earth system models, like the work from Loren Bopp that I showed at the beginning, but they've been evaluating carbon export at this fixed 100 meter depth horizon, or in other cases at the base of the euphotic zone. And we can compare those um, more commonly used depth horizons with the really strong spatial variability in the macro annual mix layer depth that we see from observations, where again, in some regions, particularly in the subpolar North Atlantic, but also in the Western North Pacific and in the Southern Ocean, we can have extremely deep mix layers in some cases down to hundreds or even a thousand meters. So the questions that I want to ask are first, how does accounting for the um, process of winter mixing change our understanding of the biological pumps global rates and spatial patterns? And second, how will the global rates and spatial patterns of the biological pump change over the 21st century when we think about um, export being carbon that gets below the winter mix layer depth? And how is that different from our prior understanding when we've been evaluating export as um, particles that sink below that fixed 100 meter depth horizon. And I'll note that in the model results that I'm about to show you, um, I'm going to be defining export as particulate organic carbon flux um, through gravitational settling. Now, I want to acknowledge clearly here that that's not the entire biological pump. And so if that's something that um, you want to think more about, make sure you stick around for Juan's talk. Um, where you're going to hear about some of these other really important processes that contribute to the biological pump. So we can look first um, at a pre-industrial control simulation from the model that I'm working with, the CCSM DEC. Um, on the left, we can see the model simulation of maximum annual mixed layer depth. Um, which looks mostly like what we see in the observations with deep winter mixing in the subpolar North Atlantic, the Western North Pacific, and in the Southern Ocean. And on the right, what I'm showing here is our comparison between our two different ways we can define export flux. Export flux at the traditionally used fixed 100 meter depth horizon versus the new depth horizon that I've introduced counting only carbon particles that sink below the maximum annual mixed layer depth. So all of the places in red are places where we find greater export at 100 meters, and all of the places in blue are where we find greater export at the maximum annual mixed layer depth. 
And you can see that the places in red where we have greater export at 100 meters or we're overestimating the strength of export when we don't account for the process of winter ventilation are the places where we have our deepest um, winter mixing each year. Um, and so we can see that a little bit more quantitatively by taking the data from each individual spatial grid cell in each of these maps and plotting the maximum annual mix layer depth on the x-axis here and the export flux difference between these two depth horizons on the y-axis. And again, we can see that the places where we have our really deep winter mix layers are the places where we're overestimating the strength of the biological pump when we count as exported only everything that sinks through the fixed 100 meter depth horizon and don't account for particles actually needing to get below that maximum annual mixed layer depth. So now that we've seen this in a pre-industrial control simulation, the question that I'm really interested in is how will the rate of carbon sequestration via export below the winter mixed layer depth change over the 21st century? And so the hypothesis that I came to this um, is first recognizing that surface warming is expected to increase stratification of the ocean under a warming scenario. And so we expect that that's going to decrease the winter ventilation depth as we move forward over the 21st century. And so that means that it's going to be easier for our sinking organic carbon particles to penetrate below the winter mixed layer depth, even if everything else is held constant, just because they won't have to sink as far to get below that winter mixed layer depth and be sequestered long term. So this has the functional effect of increasing the efficiency of export without having to change anything about the ecosystem processes. And so this has the potential to counteract some of these ecosystem driven declines in export that have been previously described using the fixed 100 meter depth horizon. So to show you some results from this work, we can first look at do we see that change in winter mixed layer depth that we expect over the 21st century? And the answer is yes. So first on the left, I'm showing you the climatological maximum annual mixed layer depth from the beginning of the century at the top compared with the uh, maximum annual mixed layer depth at the end of the century at the bottom. And then I've taken the difference between these two maps and plotted them here on the right. And so the main thing that I want you to note is that most of this map is blue. So most of the ocean has that expected decrease in winter ventilation depth over the 21st century. And we can also see that the bluest regions on the map where we have the greatest decrease in winter mixing over the 21st centuries are in the places that already have the deepest winter mixing to begin with, in the subpolar North Atlantic, the Western North Pacific, and in the Southern Ocean. So how does this influence our estimates of export flux change? So again, I'm going to show you some comparisons here. Here at the top left, I'm showing you the projections of 21st century export flux change evaluated at that traditional fixed 100 meter depth horizon. And then I'm comparing at the bottom with that same change over the 21st century, but now evaluated counting as exported only particles that sink through that maximum annual mixed layer depth horizon. And we can take the difference between these two maps and that's what I've plotted here on the right. So our difference in our understanding of how export flux will change over the 21st century if we use the maximum annual mixed layer depth instead of that fixed 100 meter depth horizon. And there are two key things I want to point out here. The first is somewhat surprisingly to me, the global overall decrease in export flux is similar no matter which of these depth horizons you use. If you integrate globally over both of these maps, we see about the same fractional change and decrease in export flux over the 21st century in this simulation. However, the spatial patterns of where we see these changes turn out to be quite different, where especially in regions of deep winter mixing, such as in the subpolar North Atlantic, we can see a strong difference between these two, where at the fixed 100 meter depth horizon, we project a decrease in export flux, and we actually see a different sign of change if we use the maximum annual mixed layer depth horizon, which instead projects an increase in the amount of particles that get below that shoaling maximum annual mixed layer depth horizon. And so we can think about that in a little bit more detail, pulling out the time series of change at two locations in that deep mixing region of the subpolar North Atlantic, in the Labrador Sea, and in the Iceland Basin. 
And so what I've plotted here is we're now looking at a cross section through the water column of particulate organic carbon flux over the entire century from 2005 to 2100. So we can see that there's this predictable um, pattern where we have an increase in flux up to a compensation depth near the base of the euphotic zone. And then, of course, below the euphotic zone, we see remineralization and attenuation of that POC flux with depth. We also see that over the course of the 21st century, those ecosystem driven processes that have been previously analyzed at the fixed 100 meter depth horizon lead to a decrease in POC flux if we follow a single depth going forward. However, if we look at the change in the maximum annual mixed layer depth shown in the black dots and the 10 year running average in the black line, we can see that that depth horizon that our particles have to sink below to be sequestered is shoaling over the 21st century. And it's shoaling faster than we're seeing those decreases in POC flux. So that the amount of particles that get below that shoaling maximum annual mixed layer depth horizon is actually increasing, even though POC flux is decreasing through that fixed 100 meters. So hopefully I've convinced you by this point that winter ventilation does reduce carbon sequestration via the biological pump in these regions of deep winter mixing, which is also our strongest ocean carbon sink regions. So some key lessons that I want you to take away from this are first that our observational studies showing that winter ventilation um, is bringing back some of this respired carbon illustrates that we need sustained time series observations of ocean carbon cycling in high latitude regions. And we need to make these measurements throughout the full annual cycle and also through the full water column, not just picking a single fixed depth horizon, but actually having flux profiles that allow us to count for this um, shoaling winter ventilation depth that we expect over the 21st century. Second, the sensitivity of our current and projected global rates and spatial patterns of export to this choice of export depth horizon means that we need to be thinking about this choice um, and thinking particularly about the importance of winter ventilation when we're analyzing output from Earth system models or from satellite model studies, rather than picking a single fixed depth horizon that allows us to then think about the question not just of how much carbon is leaving the surface ocean, but how much is going to be sequestered long term and how that's going to influence the future trajectory of the ocean carbon cycle and global climate change. And so with that, there are lots of people who have been instrumental in both the observational and modeling work that I've shown today. And particularly, I want to thank the entire Ocean Observatories Initiative Operations Team and the amazing undergraduate students who I've had the opportunity to work with on some of this, um, including going to sea at the OOI Erminger Sea Array, including um, some of these great students pictured in this photo here. Um, and so with that, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thanks for that great talk, Hillary. Um, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A or the chat, and we will uh, have them answered as we uh, switch over to our next speaker. Uh, well, I'll ask a question then. Um, Hillary, if you, um, I, I was curious about the changes that you see in um, export and the mixed layer depth control on those in climate models and whether those would be robust regardless of whether or not the um, actual model, uh, model derived carbon export is accurate or not, right? There's a lot of uncertainty in how GCMs um, get export period, but um, it seems like maybe the changes you're seeing would be robust regardless of the magnitude. Yeah, that's a great question, Seth, and one that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I think that the actual magnitude of change is probably going to be extremely sensitive to the specific model and how well it's reproducing export patterns. I also am curious whether the, um, result that it happens that whether you use that fixed 100 meter depth horizon or the maximum annual mixed layer depth leads to the same integrated global change that seems like it might be sensitive to the specific choice of model that i used for this um, which is cesm um, but i think it's 
pretty likely that the fact that we see different spatial patterns of change is likely to be robust across models because the um, the fact that we have attenuation of carbon flux with depth and we have um, increased stratification is pretty consistent across all the models. So that overall pattern, I think, is likely to be robust. But in future work, I'm really interested in looking across a wider range of models to answer that exact question. Great. Thanks. And it looks like uh, Sam Sedlecki had a similar question um, about how the uncertainty or error in modern simulation capability, uh, whether that's smaller than the changes projected. So yeah, the current uncertainty relative to the future uncertainty. Yeah, and the one thing I'll say on that is just I think our ability to actually quantify the uncertainty in the model's representation of the rates and patterns of export flux are also limited by our observational knowledge. So I think actually putting a really good numerical uncertainty on that is maybe um, something that needs more observational work as well. Um, and the other thing that I'll mention again to um, give a pointer ahead to this next talk you're about to hear is that this model also doesn't include some of the really important components of the biological pump. Um, so I haven't looked at DOC flux, I haven't looked at the particle injection pumps um, that Chuan's going to talk about. So those are also really important to think about how they would be influenced by this mechanism and how we can represent them um, in our Earth system model analyses going forward. Okay, and we might do one last question um, before moving on so we stay close on time. Um, Claire Primers had a question of whether the models extend over the margins where the mixed layer depth um, might be limited by intersection with the seafloor. So what about coastal regions? How well do we understand that? Yeah, that's a great question, Claire. And the answer, um, I think, is probably not well. Um, I did not look at coastal regions in this um, simulation and in my analysis um, because of the expectation that we probably didn't do a good job of representing coastal regions. So I think that would probably require a separate study that was really focused on doing the best we can at representing coastal regions and looking at how this process plays out. Um, not in the open ocean. Great. Um, I think any additional questions, we'll do our best to get answered after the talk. Um, but for time, we should probably move on. So thanks again, Hillary. And uh, I believe thanks. Andrea will now introduce uh, Dr. Joan Blorck. Yes. Hi. Yeah, I'm here to introduce Dr. Joan Yort. He's a biogeochemical oceanographer, uh, excited by the coupling between the blue ocean and the green ocean. Um, he originated from Barcelona and carried out a PhD with Marina Levy in Paris, then spent four years in Tasmania working with Richard Mithyar, Peter Stratton, and Phil Boyd. He's now back in Barcelona, where he joined the Earth Sciences Department of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center uh, to initiate a line of research on marine ecosystem predictions. Uh, Juan combined satellite, autonomous float, and ship-based observations with biogeochemical models. He has participated in several Southern Ocean research cruises and has worked in high performance computing environments. He's currently interested in understanding how droughts and bushfires in Australia may influence Southern Ocean phytoplankton and is starting to dabble in machine learning techniques and underwater acoustics. So today, Juan will be talking about the four dimensions of the biological carbon pump, picking up on what Hillary has just been talking about. So welcome. Hi, thank you, Andrea. Can you hear me well? Yeah. 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 Great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending today this webinar, and thank you, especially the OCV and the panelists today, to give us this opportunity to Hillary and me to present some of our work. So yeah, I will. I will. I will follow up with Hillary's talk, and I will. I will show some new processes that have been um, discovered during the recent decade, and that also influence the biological carbon pump. At the end of the talk, I hope I will combine to you that we can think in the biological camp, uh, carbon pump as a 1D um, mechanism anymore because uh, this uh, mechanism, um, this process I'm going to, to explain the work at the three dimensions and also at the temporal scale. So these are the four dimensions of the biological carbon pump. It's probably useless to say this here, but the ocean 
influences the global climate mainly because it transfers heat and carbon from the atmosphere into its interior and and it does so uh, by different mechanisms these mechanisms have traditionally been pre presented as as, as uh, individual and, and, and separated processes. One is the physical pump that is mainly due to the larger scale circulation of water masses. And the other one is, um, uh, or also as, as interannual and variability of, of the mixed layer depth, uh, as Hillary has been showing with the winter ventilation. Um, Hillary's talk was great to introduce this concept that actually the, 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 this two um, mechanisms, the physical pump and the biological pump, they actually they overlap and sometimes they interact one with the other one. Traditionally, again, biological pump has been presented as this 1D mechanism when we have a, a production of organic matter at the surface that um, creates particles of carbon that aggregate and eventually, if they are big enough, they sink into the deep ocean. Hillary has shown, though, that this, the biological pump also acts in, in longer time scales, that the organic matter stays in the water column and it actually the winter ventilation in, can impact the biological carbon pump. And in my talk, I will focus uh, on how the physical mechanisms overlap the biological pump. That means there's a number of mechanisms that have been discovered during the, the recent, the, the last 10 years thanks to high resolution models and, and, and new technologies for observing the ocean. And these mechanisms act at what we call the meso and the sub-meso scale circulation that is more or less the same time and spatial scales as phytoplankton blooms. And that gives us this overlap between the two blooms where, um, where, where interesting mechanisms um, have been discovered. This um, concept has recently been summarized in a, in a review in, in Nature by Phil Boyd and co-authors, and they called some of these mechanisms, and the ones I'm going to talk to you today, uh, as the particle injection pumps. So this diagram that comes from, from the paper I just cited, it basically shows that in addition to the biological gravitation, gravitational pump, that is the one that we all know, there's other mechanisms contributing to this to the carbon export to the organic carbon export. Uh, I will not focus on the two uh, last ones that are what we can call the migrant pump, but they're um, that they're associated with uh, vertical migrations of, of marine fauna, and we only focus on the first three: so biological biological gravitational pump, the eddy subduction pump, and the mixed layer pump. I will briefly describe the eddy subduction and the mixed layer pump. And at the last part of the talk, I will present um, two different approaches to try to evaluate the different, the relative importance of these three mechanisms. So the eddy subduction pump is uh, as, as soon as a scale driven organic export. We can in, um, clearly understand that by looking at the top right diagram in your screen, where we see at the surface uh, a soon as a scale jet of the order of, of kilometers and tens, tens of kilometers that is very intense with a strong and um, density gradient at the surface. And we also see in the section of this, of this water column, we see that there's some vertical um, velocities associated to this jet. On the less dense side of the front, we see that water is being upwelled, while on the denser part of the front, we see as, uh, a downwelling of water, actually a subduction of, of surface water when this this can happen anywhere where we have enough energy in the ocean but if on top of that uh, if on top of that we have uh, organic matter that is being produced at the surface what happens then is that when we subduct um, the the water from the surface we're actually subducting um, all the properties from the surface waters that means not only the particle the particulate organic carbon but also dissolved oxygen or the dissolved organic carbon so all the um, properties of the water mask are, are injected into the mesopelagic zone. Usually, the injections go between 200 meters to, to, to 600 meters depth. And this, this process that has been called the, the eddy pump or eddy subduction pump was, was beautifully observed and, 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 and represented in, in, in Melissa Oman's paper 2015 in Science, where they deployed, um, well, they, 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 they went with the ship, uh, they followed uh, a, meso, a mesoscale eddy, and they deployed a number of instruments around this eddy, including gliders and moorings and floats. 
and they they found that that the edge of the eddy, one of uh, the side of the eddy, there was an intrusion of 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 water um, coming into into the ocean. This is represented in the diagram here. This is an extremely efficient way to export um, uh, organic matter because because it it is very quick, and and can can export uh, as as I just said, not only particulate but any kind of of organic matter. They used their observations in, in Oman et al. paper to build the proxy that they, they coupled with a, with a physical model. And thanks to that, they were able to estimate how important the eddy subduction pump was compared to the gravitational pump. And what they found is that in regions of a strong circulation, uh, and a strong submersible circulation, like the Southern Ocean or the North Atlantic, the POC spring export and um, could half of, of the export could be explained in, uh, by, by, by the eddy subduction pump. However, it's hard to understand uh, or to observe this, this mechanism at, at, at synaptic scale because um, by definition some measure scale it lasts for days, maybe weeks, and, and, and only for very small and um, um, special um, scales. So we, we in order to, to evaluate this uh, over a, a whole ocean basin, we developed a method to detect eddy, sub, eddy subduction using major chemical hydro flows. And we applied this method into the Southern Ocean because we have a very good coverage right now with major chemical hydro flows. Um, the method is basically looking for anomalies uh, of POC and physical um, variables and also of oxygen um, in the mesopelagic um, and part of, of float profiles. So here at your left, you see a, a float profile showing an anomaly of POC and fluorescence at around 300 meters. And once we detected one of these anomalies, it means that somewhere close to this uh, float profile, there was a, an injection of matter due to some mesoscale. So the eddy, the eddy pump was, was, was somewhere around this, this, this float, this bay. What we, when we mapped these, so we applied the detection method over the whole database, and we found that um, most events uh, were, um, as expected, found in, in regions of high epikinetic energy, like, for instance, the downstream the Kerguelen plateau that is marked here in the, in the map uh, by a red circle. And in these regions of high um, epikinetic energy, we did found, uh, indeed, we did found that the POC in spring export could um, achieve 50% of, of, of the gravity of the gravitational pump. And actually, we also detected events where um, this percentage went very high, like 100 or more. But, but finally, th these events were quite rare. And I mean, we only found events in 4% 4, 4 of the whole database. And when we, when we average over the whole region and over the whole year, we found that the eddy subduction was only contributing or less than the 20% of the annual um, POC export. Um, other papers have looked at the same mechanism using different um, approaches, and they found uh, a similar values uh, as the one I just presented. So the other process is, uh, the other mechanism is the mixed layer PAM. The mixed layer PAM, can, the, the concept is very similar to the winter ventilation concept. So we have, uh, however, here we're talking about intra-seasonal variability of the mixed layer um, depth. That means that when the mixed layer depth is, is changing very quickly due to changes in the, in the atmospheric forcing, we have um, a detrainment and entrainment of organic matter from the surface into, into the layers below the mixed layer. This is especially important in spring and at high latitudes because it has been shown that quick stratifications of the mixed layer depth can, can boost and primary production of the surface. And then two days later, when they have a storm or strong winds at the surface, this mixed layer depth gets and deepens again. And this organic matter is being mixed and, and eventually entrained below the, the mixed layer. This process was first um, proposed by Dalolmo et al. Uh, using uh, satellites to estimate the carbon of the surface. And they also used physical algal floats to estimate the intra-seasonal variability of the mixed layer depth. They show that 
It can be very important in, in, in parts of the Southern Ocean and in the Northern Atlantic too, where uh, we have these, these spring blooms forming and a uh, high variability of the mixed layer depth. And, the, uh, and it was a, a significant contributor of, of carbon into the mesopelagic. More recently, and um, using this time biogeochemical alphaflows, Leo Lacour and, and co-authors managed to observe not only the, the intraseasonal changes of the mixed layer depth, but also um, the, the actual particulate organic carbon being um, subducted or being entrained below the, the, the mixing layer. One of the interesting things they did in, in this study is that they actually they measured and uh, the, the entrainment and detrainment because basically, and this is similar to what Hillary was showing, but the uh, but the shorter time scales. The what what uh, what matters finally is is the net export of matter. If we have a mixed layer data that is changing very quickly, that is shallowing and exporting some matter, but two days later is deepening again and and retraining this 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 organic matter into the surface then the net effect of, of the mixed layer depth will be zero, actually. So it's, it showed that the net effect is not that important as, as, probably, as previously thought um, with the LOLMO approach. So, but the thing is, how can we compare this mechanism? How can we evaluate the relative contribution of all of them? And also, how can we understand how they act during the seasonal cycle? Do, do, do they all act at the same place at the same time? Do they interact with themselves? That's that's actually an open question, and it's not really hard to to approach. One of the first attempts, and um, and um, is the paper published by Laura Splandy, Levy, and Makili uh, last year, where they used a high resolution model uh, that 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 is that is representing the Gulf Stream region, and and they they embedded uh, a biochemical model into this physical setting. Here. Thanks to this model, they, they managed to tease apart the different contributors um, to the biological carbon pump. So you see at the top row, we see the total export of, of, of organic matter, the gravitational pump and the subduction pump. And what they call subduction pump, it's actually constituted of three different pumps. That is the mixed layer pump, the eddy pump, and the Eichmann pump. In this, in this plot, they are showing just one day uh, of, of the model. And that's why we see that the eddy pump is, is pretty strong, actually. If we, if we look at the local export, so, so the, the, all, these, all these figures come from the paper and um, from Resplandi et al. Looking just at the local export of the subduction pumps, they show that the eddy pump can be extremely strong. So here, if you focus now in the negative values, that means the subduction due to the eddy pump, you can even exceed um, 5,000 5, milligrams carbon by meter square per day that is huge but there's very few events that are that strong and the other interesting thing of this plot is that the we also see that the other time has positive values and this is because because uh, sorry this is because the same vertical velocities that subduct matter can also add well some of this matter this this was not of and this this we did try to observe this with the, with the floats with in, in the paper we published in 2018 well but we did not find any way to detect this this um, upwelling of, of of matter but is indeed an important part of of the eddy pump and finally uh, it, it contributes to the net effect of this of this export if we now go to a larger and um, geographical box so the the average at over 100 kilometer um, square box and they show that the eddy pump is not that important when we go at these scales and that the mixed layer pump um, becomes much more important so now the question how this compares with the gravitational sorry that, that that's a summary of, of what i just said basically but if we compare with the gravitational pump what we see is that the gravitational is still the most important um, mechanisms exporting uh, organic matter However, and now we, it's important to know the, the, the different colors they represented here. The gravitational pump, by definition, only acts uh, with a sinking POC. So it, it, it's a strong um, process, but can only work in, in, in some types of, of, of organic matter. While the subduction becomes quite important when we look at, at the export by suspended POC or even to dissolved uh, organic carbon. So at the global, and um, 
the subduction pumps, they account for one third of the gravitational um, carbon flux, but they are really important looking at, at the small uh, particles and dissolved matter. The other interesting thing of, of this paper is that they show how the timing of these different pumps um, occurs. So the gravitational pump, as is, is the most well-known mechanism, it, it mostly occurs in summer during the, the, the peak of the bloom or just after the peak of the bloom, where these uh, big aggregates of, of matter are, are, are formed. While the subduction pumps, both the mixed air pump and the eddy pump, are the strongest and the most efficient during the spring. This is because in spring, the mixed layer depth um, is, is much more variable and uh, the atmospheric forcing can influence much more the upper mixing. And also the eddy pump is much more efficient because um, the, the, the mixed layer depth is, is shallow enough to, to get injections of, of water out of the mixed layer. So that shows that, and the, the, that the biological carbon pump is not only occurring in, in, in summer, it's also occurring in spring. And on top of that, if we now think about here stock, we see that it's also occurring in winter. So the whole seasonal cycle, repeating the, the idea of Hillary, it, it appears to be important for evaluating the, the, the global um, impact of a biological carbon pump. But now, can we observe this uh, somehow? I mean, which, which, which how, how should we approach this, these questions uh, in the field? So there's, there's a number of, of um, efforts to try to, to solve this question. And, and here I'm just showing two, two projects because they have really fancy and nice um, logos. Uh, most of you know more than me about experts, but they really like this diagram where they show lots of different instruments and even two ships um, to analyze all the different mechanisms of export. And they, they clearly, they beautifully show the export of one a subduction of, of organic matter coming from a bloom at the surface. The other one, the SOLAS um, cruise is organized by um, Phil Boyd in, in Tasmania and is meant to start in December if, if COVID permits. And they will also look at the migrant pump. They will also look at, at, at the migration uh, and the impacts of the animals and the carbon flux. These two projects and many more are part of, of what is, has been recently created. Uh, it's called the Jetson Community, and it's just a screenshot of the website of the Jetson Community. You're welcome to visit. From our side, we're trying to approach the question with a much, with a humble approach, probably, that is using a single float. But the float that is full equipped with a number of different sensors uh, is kind of a biogeochemical algal float, but with much more sensors, and with sensors that have been um, put, on, put onto the float in order to analyze the different um, mechanisms of the of the of, of the biological carbon pump. We deployed this float in, in the Southern Ocean, so it crossed the, as you can see in the map, it crossed the, the, the Pacific sector of, of the Southern Ocean during three years. Um, and the, the figure you can see on, on, your, on the right side of, of, of the screen, it shows how we manage, uh, we're, we're, we're still trying, but we manage and to tease apart the different, for different pumps. We did that using methods that have already been published. One is the, the, the really nice approach um, called optical sediment traps by Margaret Stapa, where they use a transmissometer looking upwards and they analyze the, the attenuation of, of the signal uh, that can be interpreted as, as a flux of, of, of particles on, on top of the, of the sensor. And also the, the, the methods developed by, um, by Lacour and, and by myself. So uh, for now, uh, well, what they're finding is it's really hard to estimate the fluxes with different these different approaches. But we we do see um, some interesting results. For instance, not surprisingly, we found that eddy pump and mixed air pump was basically found in spring, and only for one of the three seasonal cycles we analyzed. So it's, it's still pretty rare events. But what for me was most surprising is that if you now if you now look at the third plot uh, starting from the top is the continuous flux uh, on, on the optical sediment traps, we see that throughout the year, for any of the regions we analyzed, and, and it's important to note that in some of these regions, there's very, very low productivity at the surface, we always see a, a, a very low but, in, but significant um, flux of, of particles falling into, into, into the sensor. 
So again, I repeat um, the same idea that Hillary um, highlighted is that the, the, the whole seasonal cycle appears to be important to understand uh, these, these processes. So to conclude, the technological advances have revealed new mechanisms um, that contribute to biological carbon pump. And although the gravitational pump is still the strongest and the most important contributor, the mixed layer and the eddy subaction pumps have an important role on non-sinking particles and, and dissolved organic carbon. The questions now are how we analyze and how we understand these processes from a synaptic scale. And also that in order to, to, to advance uh, on, on, on the understanding of these processes, we also need to better understand how the biology and the chemistry in the mesopelagic works works and how this matter is being respired and how the, the, the marine life in this, in, this, um, in this ocean region interacts with the organic matter. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in. The chat, so we'll start off with one from Ricardo Latier. Um, how do you account for the respiration of subducted POC that takes place above the maximum depth of the winter mixed layer? Ultimately, at an annual scale, uh, the export production will be defined by the POC and DOC transported below the maximum annual mixed layer depth. Uh, so I can't hear you. The Q and A. So, yeah, they will try if to. You go to the three dots. Yeah. Um, you should be able to access it there, I believe. Yeah, great. Thank you, Madhya. Sure. So, yeah, I can't see. I can't see here the question. By the way, sorry. Can you repeat it for me, Andrea? Sorry, because I can't sure. see the yeah, question no here. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I, I can um, see it now. Yeah, from from Ricardo. Yeah, Is that right. Okay. So no, we 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 well, we don't account for 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 the respiration uh, of the puck. Yeah, that's a really good point, Ricardo. Yeah, yeah you're you're right. That see, we we're, we're really struggling with with the. To, to estimate the fluxes actually, because we, it's easier the different approaches have different fluxes. And if, for instance, we know that uh, dissolved organic carbon is being transported, but we are not able to, under, to, to, to estimate how much of it is, 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 being, is being naturally um, and transported. So, so we detect it, but, but, but we are not able to, to compute the flux. Um, so I can't see how, how, to re, how to answer your question right now with the data we have. Okay, we have another um, another yeah. question here. Uh, okay. So, is continuous flux that you measured throughout the year composed uh, by sinking POC or a mix between sinking and suspended? Is is thank you, thank you, Bruna, for your question. It's mostly sinking pump because it, it uh, actually the, the the way that um, this approach works needs that the matter is being is, it, it it actually deposits over the sensor, so it's sinking. But we what we what we can do, because we have different optical back scatterings of, on the float, is that we manage to have not expect not a spectra because we only have two, two values, but we manage to to see if there's large or, or small particles. So when we talk about the continuous and um, flux, we talk about how the attenuation um, of, of of matter by small particles, while sometimes what we see is that the attenuation um, jumps actually. So we have the, the attenuation and um, we lose you know a uh, one person of attenuation in one in one day and that means that there's not no that there's there's a, a large particle that that this day deposited over the sensor so this allow us to kind of understand if there's large aggregates and small or small particles but they are all sinking POC. what we are trying to do with by organizing these two types of particles is trying to relate it with with the types of blooms that we see at the surface I had another um, question that I can follow up with. Um, I was curious, there have been sort of different findings or different levels of export from um, different observational studies looking at the eddy pump. And I, they've been done with different platforms, floats versus gliders. And I was wondering if you thought that the platform might have some 
impact on um, the frequency of observed uh, eddy pump um, well, the, occurrences. The, the ones I've shown, I think they, they both used um, basochemical argo floats. Uh, or, or at least a float that had nitrate uh, for the Stoker um, paper. I, I can see uh, uh, when I've seen the, the use of glider for, for, for the subduction, uh, the glider provides uh, a really neat view of the 3D dimension of, of this subduction, but it, for me it's really hard, or I've never seen an estimation of, of flags of, of, or export from the glider. Because I think that it, it becomes much harder to, 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 to estimate by the fact that the glider is moving. Um, I, I, I struggle to understand, I, I'm not an expert on gliders, but I struggle to understand how you estimate a vertical flux from, from a platform that is actually moving uh, in the horizontal. Well, I guess I meant, um, I think the Oman study, I thought that was with a glider. Yeah, 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 it is, but uh, they did not estimated flux from the glider, if I'm right. Not the incision. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see if there's another question here. Yeah, we have one from Eric Krim. Um, what role can Lagrangian mixed layer floats um, that can estimate vertical mixing fluxes play in the future? But the, that's, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know, I don't know. Are, are they really in Lagrangian? <laughs> that was the question. But yeah, if they're in Lagrangian, this is awesome because, because it means that um, one of the issues we got with when detecting the eddy pump is that we detected the, we detected the fingerprint of the eddy pump, but we, we didn't know where this water was coming from, actually. So it would be really cool to, to, to relate the, 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 the POC anomaly or the, the organic carbon anomaly uh, at the mesopelagic to relate it to the process of the surface where the, where the subduction originated. And, and, and for this sense, um, the Lagrangian floats can, can be really useful. Yeah, great question. Any other questions from the audience? Or the panel? All right, so I think with that, we can wrap up and just thank the speakers again and the participants for attending. Uh, Heather, is there anything else to close up? No, thank you all for joining us. We hope you'll join us for the next OCB webinar in two weeks. And again, we will record this and we'll, we'll let you know when it's posted on our YouTube. And we will have the speakers follow up with any questions that we didn't have time to answer during the webinar. So thank you, everybody, Good. until the next two weeks. <laughs> <laughs>